Back before 1940, American car companies had few common rules and regulations to follow, so there were no standards on important safety features, such as headlights. This led to each automaker having to source their own and often unreliable headlight parts that were becoming increasingly difficult and costly to repair. In 1940, the U.S. government stepped in and required all cars sold here to share the same 7-inch round sealed beam headlights. This challenged car designers to make their car's face look unique, despite all having the same eyes, which led to lots of creative workarounds. Although some concessions were later made to allow for smaller quad lights and later square lights instead of round, it wasn't until 1983 that Ford finally convinced the U.S. government to allow composite headlights, and the world of car design changed forever, and for the better. This is a story of the evolution of American car headlights. This is my old car. If you were born in the U.S. in the 1990s or later, you've likely only known cars to each have their own unique headlight design. Headlights play a significant role in the car's overall identity, and whether we mean to or not, I think most of us tend to treat the front end of a car as a face, and the headlights represent the eyes of that face. Our attention is often directed towards those eyes, just like when we look at another person's face. So I was surprised when the first Cars movie from Pixar was released in 2006, and their eyes weren't the headlights, but instead were in the windshield. You know, I mean, we might even clear it up to buy you some headlights. Are you saying he doesn't have headlights? That's what I'm telling you. It's just stickers. They probably did this to help keep the insides of the cars hidden, as there were no humans in their world that could be inside. Which makes me wonder why cars in their world have doors. <gasps> what the? Do yeah. I give you okay. good advice. Although regulations still exist today for the position of the headlamps in relation to their distance to the ground and the angle in which the light is projected, car designers today have a lot of flexibility in how the headlights are integrated into the front end. I'm a good fairy, and I grant you three wishes. Three steps aside, please. On many cars today, daytime running lamps, or DRLs, have become more prominent in the look of the car than the headlights, as advancements in LED technology requires far less reflective services to project the light and in turn allows for much smaller housings for the bulbs. But if you were born in the U.S. in the 1970s or earlier, you likely remember a time when car headlights played little to no role in distinguishing one model from another, as every car was required by U.S. regulations to conform to specific shapes and sizes. All car designers could do was change the position of the headlights, as well as have the headlights either fixed in place or concealed when turned off to make their car different than their competitors. These regulations made a lot of sense when they were first created 85 years ago, but they managed to stay in place with very little changes for far too long. Most of the first automobiles, or horseless carriages as they were known at the turn of the 20th century, didn't even have headlights. That's not the brake. No. Those that did typically used the same that were on horse-drawn carriages, which were lanterns providing light via a flame fed by either oil or acetylene gas. They used a mirror lens to project the light forward, but they couldn't be well focused and often lit up the sky as much as the ground below. Electric lights were first available as an option in the Columbia electric car in 1898, but they were unreliable and low on power thanks to how small early power generators, or dynamos, had to be to fit in the car. Peerless was the first car manufacturer to offer electric headlights as standard in 1904, but they were still an isolated electrical system within the car. It wasn't until Cadillac offered the first modern electrical system which integrated the headlights with the ignition system that such a design became the standard used on all future cars. By 1930, there were over 200 different automobile manufacturers, and when it came to headlights, each one had their own version. They were all similar in shape and size, but that was primarily due to each manufacturer effectively copying what had become a common look for all cars. A notable exception was the Cord 810 and 812 in 1936, which hid its headlamps underneath the front fenders, and required the driver to raise and lower them with a manual crank on the dashboard. But the Cord's headlights were like every other car, in that its parts were unique to the company, so when parts failed, getting replacement parts was increasingly challenging. The end result was too many examples of ghost cars, or cars traveling in the dark with no lights at all. And since headlights were an important safety feature of every car, the U.S. government got involved. Starting in 1940, all cars that were to be sold in the U.S. were required to have sealed beam headlights that could be universally installed in any model. The bulbs could not be removed as they were sealed inside the lamp housing, with a three-prong adapter that allowed for both low and high beam operation. Since the bulb could not be removed, the seal around the reflective housing remained intact, thereby decreasing the chance of water getting in. If any part of the headlight failed, the entire headlight housing would be replaced, not any of the individual parts inside. While this greatly simplified headlight maintenance, it meant that every car had to have two 7-inch round headlights. 
This only left the front grille and bumper design to distinguish one car from another. Although World War II forced a break in auto production soon after this regulation took effect, the full impact was being felt by the end of the decade, as car designers kept pushing for regulations to be loosened to allow for other headlight options. Those changes didn't come until 1957, when a new round headlight size of 5 and 3 quarter inches was allowed, and the number of headlights on each car could be doubled to four. This new size also had different connections on the back, to allow for one bulb on each side to be the low beam headlight, and the other to be the high beam headlight. As most cars made changes to their body style nearly every year back then, this new quad headlight option was picked up on many cars starting that year. However, not every U.S. state approved it that year, meaning that in some states, only the original 7-inch dual headlights were allowed. So to get around this, some cars were offered with either dual or quad headlight designs in 1957, with the quad version being the more upscale option for states that allowed both. By 1958, all U.S. states approved the smaller quad headlights, and they quickly became more common than dual headlights. Such an example was a C1, or first generation Corvette, which would be the only Corvette where the headlight design changed within the same generation. Although quad headlights were typically arranged horizontally, as the car industry moved into the 1960s, some of them were stacked vertically or even diagonally. Meanwhile in Europe, where fuel efficiency was a much bigger concern, cars sold there starting in the mid-1950s, offered composite headlight designs, which not only allowed for better airflow and better gas mileage, but also allowed car designers more creative options. But this also impeded the sale of these cars in the U.S., unless the European manufacturer came up with a workaround to make it legal. The end result were cars like this Audi that were clearly supposed to have composite headlight housings, but the entire front end design was ruined by forcing the round headlights into a space not designed for them. Did you steal this thing, dude? No, actually, it's a loner. Sports car designers had their own unique challenge to make the car more aerodynamic, and so round headlights sitting at a right angle to the base of the car often didn't work. Some designers made it work, like the Porsche 911 and Datsun 240Z, but typically it just created a wall that inhibited airflow. This is what really led to the popularity of pop-up headlights, which allowed the car to remain aerodynamic, although only when the lights were off. Some automakers like Porsche got creative with cars like the 928, in which the headlights were always visible, but laid flat when turned off. For luxury cars, where aerodynamics didn't matter as much, putting the headlights behind covers was an increasingly common option in the 60s and 70s, with some truly clever ways to maintain a certain style across the front of the car. Although I always thought these hidden headlights were a cool look, it admittedly made the car look like its eyes were closed, which in turn made it look like it was winking, when one of the pop-up mechanisms inevitably failed. The next change in headlights may have helped contribute to an overall car style of the late 70s and early 80s. After enough pushback from the big three automakers to allow other headlight designs, in 1975 the U.S. government allowed a new headlight design that was square. This time, instead of enforcing measurements in inches, they used metric to allow foreign automakers to more easily comply. Square headlights could either be 200 millimeters in width if using dual headlights, or 165 millimeters for quad headlights. Since the curvy car body styles of the early 70s were built around the round headlights, not every automaker switched to the square headlights right away. Those that did had mixed results, as the square headlights didn't always mesh well with the curves in the bodywork. But by the late 70s and early 80s, with fuel efficiency standards requiring significant downsizing, the square headlights seemed to influence the entire car to be square as well. Although round headlights were still legal, the introduction of square headlights nearly killed them off. Cars that kept the same design for decades, like the Volkswagen Beetle, didn't change or cars that wanted to maintain a retro look, such as the Mazda Miata, which had round headlights within their pop-ups from 1989 to 1997. That last one was an unusual exception for two reasons. Not only had the regulation that required only round headlights expired in 1975, but the need for pop-ups themselves had been obsolete for six years before the Miata hit the streets for the first time. This is because in 1983, Ford finally convinced the U.S. government to let them offer a composite headlight design for their 1984 Lincoln Mark 7. These new composite headlights were no longer sealed beams, but instead the headlight bulb could be removed from the back of the headlight housing under the hood. Soon after the Mark 7, Ford would also offer composite headlights on its Mercure XR4 Ti, which although was new to the US market, it had been selling for a few years branded as a Ford in Europe, where composite headlamps had been the norm for nearly three decades by that point. That last fact is why some American automakers referred to the newly updated US sold cars as now having a European look. In 1985, for the 1986 model year, Ford introduced the Taurus with composite headlights, 
which worked well with the car's more jelly bean shape. The Taurus wasn't the first Ford to have considered composite headlamps in its future, as the Tempo's more rounded styling arrived in 1984, but with square headlights recessed into holes clearly designed for composite housings. By the 1986 model year, the Tempo and its Mercury twin, the Topaz, adapted as well. GM and Chrysler were a bit slower to adapt, as they didn't have as many cars in their pipeline with designs that would work better with composite lamps. When they did change, they were still on their older boxy cars, so the composite lamps only served to make the car look slightly less old, since the boxy styles dropped in popularity by 1990. GM also decided to keep some cars with rectangular headlamps, but they were smaller than the former regulated size, becoming their own unique styling element. This could be seen in cars like the Geo Storm, which started with covers that partially concealed the former regulation size headlights, but were later replaced with smaller rectangular headlights that could fit in the same space without the mechanized cover. These smaller headlights were also on the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme and the Chevy Camaro, although the latter would later change to composites during the same generation. Other European makes which have been forced to create alternative headlight designs for the U.S. market simply went back to the same headlights they were selling in Europe, so they had the easiest time adapting to the removal of this long overdue restriction. Overall, it benefited all automakers in the long term, as car designers could make each model's headlight shape unique, and I think it contributed to the bubble-shaped cars that had become the trademark look in the 90s. But the switch to composite headlights also had their drawbacks. The manufacturers of the sealed beam headlights, as well as those who made equipment that tested their alignment, would quickly lose customers, as more and more cars chose to drop the sealed beams. Exceptions were cars like the Jeep Cherokee XJ and the Wrangler, that would hold on to their original sealed beams for several more years as they fit the car's old-school retro design, or base model work pickups that offered the sealed beams as a cheaper alternative. The latter continued with the GM work vans as late as 2017. Sometimes he parts the special cars in a special place. Sealed beams also remain in cars that continued, at least for the short term, to have pop-up headlights. But as the 1990s progressed, most cars with pop-ups transitioned to composites, since the original need for pop-ups was eliminated, and it also eliminated the extra cost in their production. Although not as prevalent in the U.S. in the 90s, pedestrian safety regulations have been around for many years in Europe, and pop-ups typically can't conform to those rules. But for some cars, the pop-ups were so ingrained in the car's heritage that they kept them into the 2000s. The Lotus Esprit started with pop-ups in 1978 and kept them until its end in 2004. There was also the fifth generation or C5 Corvette, which had pop-ups from 1997 to 2004, following the trend of the C4, C3, and C2 that preceded it. The design of the C5 started well after they no longer were required to use sealed beams, so the car's heritage clearly played a role in that decision. But by 2005, to avoid looking too old school and to comply with pedestrian regulations, even the Corvette finally left the pop-ups behind. As I write this in 2025, it is extremely rare to see a car on the road with sealed beam headlights. Even cars from the 2000s, when composites had been legal for a couple decades, look old today, as the composite housings on some cars grew to unusually large sizes to help better disperse the light of their legacy halogen bulbs. Binky, any thoughts? It scares the f out of me. However, as LED technology improved, starting with the Audi R8, the composite headlights housings continue to shrink. They also shrunk as daytime running lamps, or DRLs, became more popular. Although Volvos and Saabs had some form of DRLs since the 70s, and Canadian cars required them starting in 1989, they didn't first become a feature in U.S. cars until 1995, and even then, they usually just had the high beam bulb double as a DRL. But by the 2010s, more and more car designers figured out that the DRL could itself be a styling element, especially as LED and laser technology improved. The 2014 Jeep Cherokee was one of the first I remember to really push the DRL to prominence, as the DRLs were positioned where the headlights should have been. Although the next-gen Cherokee moved the headlamps back to where they normally were, GM has updated most of its U.S. lineup with all-new Chevrolet, Buick, and Cadillac models positioning the DRLs where the headlights have traditionally always been. It's a look I suspect no car lover would ever have predicted 40 years ago. You got a Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 70s to mid 2000s that you barely see today and like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. Oh, don't mess with history.